who have arranged for hospitality. We're so grateful for that. It's wonderful to, to see everyone coming together for these events. We're going to begin by prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, again, welcome to all of you. This is our seventh of our eight-part series on sacraments in the Spirit. And today I'd like to speak about the sacraments and consecration. Let's start by going back to something that most of us, I think, are aware of, which is the original meaning of the word sacrament. The word sacrament was used in its time in places like the Roman Empire with the Roman military. Sacramentum is probably closest to what we would understand by the word oath, a kind of solemn oath that was typically made by soldiers as they entered formally into obedience and service of the emperor. Uh, and so what they did was they took a sacramentum. And so it meant a kind of a sacred, solemn oath or pledge. And with all of the things, you would probably associate that with us. This is very helpful for us because among the very beautiful and important elements of the sacraments is this notion of an oath. And this, in fact, is what I wish to concentrate on today as we speak about the sacraments. The word that comes down to us sometimes is the word consecration. Consecration itself is a very, very important word. It has its origins all the way back, of course, in the Old Testament. Consecration is sometimes simply defined as a person or a thing, a place, a time that is set apart and specifically set apart for sacred purposes. Thus we see the word in the consecrations sacred. So we would say that when you build a church, you consecrate the church. You have it set apart. It's no longer to be used for this or that. It's meant to be used for sacred places or for sacred worship. Similarly, we have certain times that are considered consecrated. It's not appropriate for us on Sundays to do certain kind of menial labor. Why? Because that day has been set apart. It's consecrated. We, of course, speak about people, religious sisters and brothers being consecrated. They're no longer free to marry. They no longer have a certain way of life they might have had before. But now they're set apart. They're consecrated. Well, one of the interesting things about this word consecration, as it applies to our Lord himself, if we read it in the Gospels, especially the Gospel of St. John, is that consecration has a kind of a twofold element to it that really mirrors what we sometimes say about the sacraments, namely that they're both objective, ex opere operato, they operate by being operated, that is, they bring grace when they're simply done, but also there is what you might want to call a subjective dimension, that is, ex opera, ex opere operantos. They're, they operate according to how they are done. And in a similar way, what we read in the Gospel of St. John is two things about Jesus. One is, it says that he has been consecrated by the Father. In other words, God the Father has done a work of consecrating him, setting him apart, of course, for his mission here on earth and all of that. But at other times, in the Gospel of St. John, Jesus says, I consecrate myself. In other words, it's not just something that God the Father does, but I myself consecrate myself to God the Father. And there, once again, you see this wonderful twofold dimension of consecration. It's both an objective thing that happens, God does it, but also it's something that we have a part to play ourselves. Now, let's take a look at some of the common elements of consecration that we've had over the years. Thank you. Over the years, we've had a number of elements. For those of you listening to this tape, we've gone about five minutes. <laughs> I'll find a way to bring back some of the golden oldies with this, this tape. Thank you very much. One of the th let's look at some of the common elements of different expressions of consecration. One of them is this is that whenever, and this is true, believe it or not, even back to the Roman soldiers in paganism, whenever there is a consecration, there is always a sponsor or sponsors of that. We could give it different names. But let's look, for example, at the most obvious examples of sacraments. 
When someone becomes baptized, they have a godfather, godparents. They have people who serve as their sponsors. They stand for them and they declare the goodwill, the intentions, the sincere faith of that person to be baptized. We, of course, see that not only with adult baptisms, but also with little infants being baptized. There is a godparent. There are godparents. There are sponsors. And they stand in their place and say, I wish to declare that this person who is about to be consecrated is, in fact, serious about what they're doing and sincere and all the rest. Again, in confirmation, we call, typically call them sponsors, but again, a very similar role. And in these ceremonies, they're always right next to the person. In fact, with babies, it's customary for the godparents to hold the little child as a part of the baptism ceremony. That's how closely this person works. They are the sponsors. And when a person gets, uh, again, confirmed, it's typically the sponsor placing their right hand on the shoulder of the person as the bishop confirms them. We see this in other ways as well. Say, take, for example, the beautiful, famous consecration according to the order of St. Louis de Montfort. Really, you can describe this in many ways. But in some ways, the instinct, the deep instinct of St. Louis de Montfort is this, is that in a consecration such as he calls for, the Blessed Mother is the sponsor. Again, we don't typically think of that, but she is the one. She is the all-important one who stands with us as we offer ourselves to Christ and says that the Blessed Mother not only stands for us and basically speaks up for us and says, yes, my son, this one is sincere and worthy to be consecrated, but of course we speak about the fact that the consecration happens through her. And again, this is a very important dimension of all consecration. There is always a sponsor. It can be the Blessed Mother, the angels and the saints. It often has human beings like our godparents and confirmation sponsors and so forth. This actually runs through several of the sacraments. You know, when a priest gets ordained, he typically looks to several priests as his sponsors. Uh, typically, a newly ordained priest chooses, for example, a priest to put on his vestments. I'm sure if you've been to an ordination, you see that, again, he's chosen someone, some priest, who will actually place the priestly vestments on him. It's a great honor. It's a great honor to be asked to do so by a new priest. You'll also see, of course, the priest one by one, the whole group of archdiocesan priests, one by one placing their hands, just after they've been ordained by the bishop, one by one, these, these, other, these brother priests essentially sponsoring this man, saying, he's one of us, he's good, they place their hands of blessing on him. The other custom, as you probably know, is that, especially in the old days, it was very typical, still is somewhat very typical, for a priest at his first mass to have another priest preach the homily. And that's just not because he's been too busy to organize a homily, it's because it's a particular honor always given to some priest that has had a real role in their lives, who's essentially sponsored them in their ordination, and that priest serves as a kind of a visible sponsor as they preach their first homily. I think I've told a few of you this story, that I've done a few first homilies for some of my former seminarians, and I try to tease them a little bit. I remember with Father Anthony Craig up in the, the Duluth Diocese, I went up, wonderful young priest, and he asked me to preach his first homily, so I get up to the pulpit, and I started by saying, you know, I'm sure a number of you are disappointed that you're not having Father Craig uh, preach this homily and so forth. Here he is, the new priest. And then I turned to him and I said, now, it's, uh, it's still not too late. Would you like to give the homily, Father? You've got to keep these young priests on their toes, you know. <laughs> but look at the pattern. Consistently, consistently, at that moment of consecration in the sacraments, and even in with religious life, and even in some beautiful consecrations like that offered by St. Louis de Montfort, there is the idea of sponsorship. I say this because, to take it one step further, as I look and see what has seemed to make the difference, whether it is for someone who's made a personal consecration spiritually, or someone even who's gone through the sacraments, or in other sorts of spiritual forms of renewal, it makes a great deal of difference if there are others who are walking with you through that. In other words, one of the beautiful things about 33 days and these other related movements is a person isn't simply going off into the woods and reading a few books and praying a few prayers, but they're being accompanied by people, including those who in some ways have walked before them, have already made a consecration. And that's a deep Catholic instinct. The Life in the Spirit seminars were not typically a sort of an individualistic thing. You go off into the woods, and this is true of almost all these related movements. Instead, 
there's a circle of people who are walking with you through this process and in some ways join with you in the great and important moments of consecration. This is part of what God wants to renew in all of the sacraments. He wants to renew a sense that we're not just walking through it. I mean, let's be honest, we occasionally have little babies being baptized here, never seen their parents or family in my life. God bless them. They come in, you know, a little sheepishly and nervously. I don't know exactly where the church is and so forth. That's fine, all right. All right, we baptize the baby as we should, regardless regardless of whether their family is into it. This became a kind of a cool thing around here for a few years, you know. If the parents don't go to 32 sessions of this or that, they don't get their child baptized. Pope John Paul II said, no, no, no. Don't punish the baby by the parents or family's lack of faith, all right? Try to deal with that faith somehow, but don't hold back baptism until they score an 82% or higher on their test and so forth, all right? You get them baptized. But it is the case that most of us would acknowledge and look back and say to the extent that we had a real sense of people walking with us at these important moments of our lives, that made a difference on whether the kind of ongoing effects of those sacraments really came through. And so sacraments, first of all, I'm reviewing, first of all, they are, they are a kind of oath. They're kind of a very solemn pledge to God. They're characterized, among other things, by being done with sponsorship, whether it's the Blessed Mother and the saints or humans around us, and our godparents, and so forth. Second thing, this goes back to some things we talked about at the end of last week's talk. The second thing is, there is certain kinds of preparation, and I mentioned three elements to it. One of them is fasting. Again, we as a culture have lost a sense of fasting, except for health reasons and so forth. But the powerful spiritual effects of fasting you never had a big moment in the life of the church without fasting ahead of times. And again, some of us go back far enough to remember different versions of it. You remember, for example, a very interesting thing called Ember Days. Do any of you remember the Ember Days? You'd often see the little, little signal on the calendars you got from the Catholic funeral home, etc. And again, Ember Days, it's a very complicated history, but to make it short, Ember Days were four times each year in which a week had three days of fasting. Uh, and again, part of it was to keep you in shape. It was, it was tied in with some of the big feasts, but especially it was the idea that all through the year, there should be times where we're not getting too lazy uh, and fat and sloppy and so forth, so we have these ways to keep us. The most important fiat fast days, of course, were related to upcoming feasts. And again, we know not only the sort of two traditional ones we associate, which are day Fridays, uh, which are anticipation of Sundays, representing the Lord's death and passion and death on a Friday, uh, but also, of course, Lent, the 40 days of Lent. Now, the days of Advent also have their own element of fasting, even though it's not the principal focus like it is in Lent. Nevertheless, the idea was, if you're going to have a feast, you must fast in preparation for it. And that's why the church has always had a Eucharistic fast. Now, we talked a little bit last week about the way those things have come and gone and changed, and sadly, how few people even fast for one hour before the reception of Holy Communion today. But I want to say to all of us, to all of us, that it's important for us to remember, as we make any form of consecration, even as we approach the sacraments, it's very good for us to fast. I, by the way, you may not realize that there's some people who fast as they prepare for confession. Now, what that's going on is, is not the sense of I want to sort of be prepared for the sacred food of the Eucharistic sacrament, so I don't want to have other foods, etc. But it's very specifically focused on the idea that I want to be clear th thinking, clear minded, and so forth. It's important for us to prepare well to make a good confession. And so many people are careful not to be chewing on something or gulping something down just before they come to celebrate that sacrament. It's also the case, though, that for all of us, in any important moments of our lives, Fasting has great value of preparedness. And again, we could give a whole lengthy talk or two about fasting, but I just want to remind us that if we're preparing for any sort of major moment of consecration, any major moment regarding the sacraments, fasting is very essential. Our Lord himself models it as he begins his earthly ministry. He prepares for his three years of ministry by taking the 40 days in the desert, and that's the pattern that all of us should have afterwards. Again, happy to talk more about fasting, but let's talk about the second thing I mentioned last week. And that is, for many people, it's very important for us to go to confession before we celebrate sacraments. 
Again, whether we have the tradition of going to confessional Saturday afternoons before Sunday Mass, I have wonderful married couples who ask, please, to meet with me for confession during the hour or two before they get married. There are people, of course, who receive all sorts of sacraments who come to confession. Justin Cordham here, who directs our confirmation program, makes a very strong push that all these young people should go to confession before they're confirmed in the faith. I mention this to all of us here because at key moments in our lives, it's very important for us to go to confession. I've spoken about making a general confession. You know, really by happy coincidence, our final session next week, our eighth week, happens as we just enter into the month of November. And the month of November is dedicated to the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Every one of us is going to go through three of the four. <laughs> just a matter which three you're going to go, okay? But we all get three of them. Congratulations, all right? Well, November is a wonderful time to make a confession. Again, it's a time for us, memento mori, to remember death. It's the time to put that old skull on our desktop to say, you know, as he is, there I one day will be as well. And so I encourage all of us, as we prepare for the great mysteries of Advent and Christmas, that as we go through November, please be sure to make a good confession. Let's talk a little bit about a general confession. Why has the church often mentioned a general confession at a time of consecration? General confession is the popular name for making a confession that reviews our entire lives. And some of you know that this is done, is required at different moments. Again, they ask that all priests who are being ordained to the diaconate make a general confession, meet with a priest and confess your sins all the way from the beginning. Many of you know that this is done at other moments, that it's very valuable to do, especially when we're consecrating ourselves to Christ. Now, people have different questions, which is how much detail you know, uh, you know, back when I was seven, you know, I think I took my sister's blue, cray blue crayon, my little red crayon, and so forth. I will talk to the priest about that. It can vary, by the way. There are some general confessions in which, to be honest, the devil's in the details, and it can be very important for us to talk about some things. In other cases, we don't want to be silly and think that somehow this is a, a nervous, scrupulous act and if we don't exactly remember each and every potato chip we stole, we're not going to be having God's mercy and forgiveness. But a good general confession often has two elements to it. This is what makes a, the power of a good general confession. The first of them is, is we see the connection. We see the connection between perhaps many particular sins that we've committed and what the uh, great spiritual directors and saints of the past have called our cardinal our cardinal sins or offenses. Again, one of the long-standing streams in Catholic theology says that if you take a look at the seven deadly sins, each person is especially subject to one of them. And it's worth doing very careful work with a spiritual director or confessor because they're not often the obvious. You might have someone, for example, who is consistently dealing with sexual sins. And you might say, oh, it's obvious their issue is lust. But many a good spiritual director over the centuries have said that even though, yes, those different sins involve lust, of course, the sin of lust, many people who battle sins of moral impurity are not primarily or underneath it all fundamentally dealing with lust, but sometimes other issues. And again, it can be wrath, it can be pride, and we could, again, take a whole course to talk about that. But one of the beauties of a good general confession is is as you speak about your sins, even if you yourselves aren't exactly sure how you connect the dots, what you do is you help the priest to be able to help you. Many times what a priest does in a general confession is say, well, I see in all the different things you've mentioned a certain underlying, ongoing issue. And again, sometimes it's a bit surprising uh, what the priest might say to you. But that's one of the values. The second particular value of making a general confession, no pun intended, but the great value of making a general confession is it often does give witness to God's work in our lives. It might be true that ever since I was six years old, I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel and haven't made a darn bit of progress, but in general, as we do review our lives, we do see the hand of the Lord working through different challenges and issues in our lives. It might be the case that once when we were younger, we battled a particular sin, and now, thanks be to God, it's not so serious. It might be the matter that before we were wandering and, and ignorant about something, but the Lord has shown us a path, a way to guard that uh, near occasion of sin. And that's a real beautiful testimony to God's gracious assistance. 
But anyway, making a general confession does not have to be some gloomy oh boy, and then I did this. <laughs> oh, then I did that. But it's also a recognition of the beautiful ways that God has been working in our souls. So, obviously, a general confession takes a little longer than usual, and that's why what I'm doing is during the next week, between now and next Saturday morning, if you take a look at the different confession times that I'm offering, you know, I offer confession ten times each week, I will be going into the confessional a half an hour before those scheduled times. So, for example, each weekday morning I'm there at 7.30, but this week I'm going to show up at 7 o'clock. God willing. I'm going to show up at 7 o'clock. Uh, and again, if you want to have a more extended general confession, I invite you to come then. I ask you please not to come during the regular times when there's 20 people there for the good old basic, you know, silver car wash. Okay, if you're looking for the, you're looking for the platinum wash, okay, you might want to schedule a slightly earlier time to come and so forth, all right? Likewise, uh, beginning this, this evening at my typical 4 o'clock Saturday confession, I'll be here at 3.30. Tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, instead of the typical time I'd have at 7.30, I'll be here at 7 o'clock and so forth. So just take a look at the typical times. Uh, again, I'm eager to hear confessions for anyone who would like especially to have a general confession. And don't be nervous if you don't know exactly how to do that. But again, just <coughs> please come and let me know you'd like to do that. Again, it need to take more than a total of 10 or 12 minutes. Again, uh, it's, it's very good for us to do. The third thing that I mentioned, I've talked about the role of fasting. Fasting is always, you know, the word fast and feast, as you know, they come from the exact same word, okay? Uh, you know, if you studied English, certain words in English uh, add the letter, you know, A to mean not, okay? You know, uh, you know, you know, I'm not this or not that. You put the word A, other things you put. But anyway, the word fast comes from the word for feast, and it means, you know, again, take the A away, and it's something that happens before, prior, <coughs> in contrast to feasting. I also love any chance to pull out that old Bomo, uh, which they can't seem to figure out who said it first, but again, that beautiful truth that when Catholics feast, they feast, and when they fast, they, uh, uh, they feast. <laughs> we love the feast, but the fasting is, is a very important part of the great feast of our faith. So fasting is very important. Making a good confession is very important. And then this third element that I mentioned last week, I do want to highlight, which is it's very important for us to write a kind of will and testament. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, the idea is this, is that as we prepare for a great moment of sacramental initiation or consecration, it's very important for us to put into words, to take the time to put into words what we hereby understand we're doing. Uh, again, we still have relics of that in different ways. We, of course, have in the legal world, last will and testament. We, we make sure we say, okay, I hereby declare this is what's going on. And then it trickles into other ways. Some of us who are into keeping a spiritual journal, uh, you know that sometimes what happens with a spiritual journal, it's a moment for us to say, all right, I want to put into words what I am and what I'm doing, how I'm giving myself to God, and so forth. Again, I mentioned last week that one of the things many people don't realize is that before a priest uh, before it becomes a deacon and then becomes a priest, you have to write, and it's interesting, a handwritten letter a handwritten letter is sent to the archbishop asking, please, to ordain me to the diaconate and to the priesthood. Isn't that interesting? Well, it's kind of, a, it's kind of an evolutionary tailbone. It's the relic of something that used to be much more developed, and that is that the priest, or the, the candidate, literally wrote and said, I want to be a priest. Here's why I want to be a priest. Let me tell you the best, so that the bishop can look at that and say, hmm, okay, this fellow seems to be thoughtful and well-prepared and sincere and so forth. Or the opposite. Hmm, this guy doesn't seem to get it. I better call the, call the seminary and say, I don't think this guy understands what's about to happen. But isn't that interesting? You write a handwritten note in requesting ordination, which is your kind of testimony. And you say, I wanted to be a priest in such and such, and here's why I want to be a priest and so forth. There's something very valuable in doing that. And as you know, it's true in many of the beautiful spiritual movements that they ask before consecration that you write something like that. You put into your own words, sincerely, your own interests and intentions. Well, why is that? Well, of course, it's because there's just something good about writing things down. And by the way, I mean writing things down, not texting, not emailing, not uh, you know, putting on the computer. Uh, there's, there's nothing quite like putting pen to paper. Uh, you probably know that there's still, there's some still old-fashioned professors who say that one of the best ways to learn something is to copy it down. 
and you're like, holy moly, Father, we're in 2016. But there are some wonderful theology professors and others who say there's nothing quite like writing writing St. Augustine's famous statements down. Oh, come on, y'all. Late have I love the ever ancient, ever new, and so forth. I'm telling you, you will remember that if you write it down because the act of writing something down forces you to think about what you're writing down. What am I... Late... Um, late... Di, uh, late... Have... I love you, all right? So, there's something powerful in writing things down. Uh, again, I think we all still know, maybe more than ever, that when you now get a handwritten note from someone, boy... That's worth his weight in gold. That took this person three and a half minutes to do. That's three and a half precious minutes. Well, these are just sort of simple ways of explaining this. But please, if you're preparing for a time of sacramental initiation, if you're preparing for a consecration, traditionally you write something down in which you state your intentions. You write it to the Lord. You write it to your bishop. You write it to your spiritual director, or your religious superior. But I strongly encourage us to do that. Those of you who were at Mass this morning heard a variation on this. You heard me talk at Mass today about St. Paul delivering several times, according to the Scriptures, his kind of last will and testament. Remember when he was standing on the dockside? What a powerful moment in Scripture. He says to his, his people, especially his leaders, his shepherds, he says, you will not see me again as he gets ready to board the ship for Rome. And it says they all wept and threw their arms around St. Paul, knowing they'd never see him again. Well, read what St. Paul said on the dockside there. He had some things to say, including what I'll say <clears throat> when I leave Transfiguration, okay? Watch out, all right? There's wolves that are going to try to come and attack the pack, all right? All right, watch out for that and so forth, all right? Uh, I know that. Every priest knows that. It's, it's amazing. Well, here's my point, though, is that we want to give to others our will and testament, saying, please remember what I've taught you, what I've told you. Please carry forward what's happened here. But in the same way, as we're consecrated to God, we offer to Him those sentiments. Lord, here I am, here is what I'm offering to you. Now, what often happens is most of us have been through the sacraments, at least the sacraments of initiation, other sacraments, and so we're sitting here saying, okay, Father, this is a wonderful talk to give some 10-year-old who's going to get confirmed or something like that. But what are you really talking to us about here? Well, I, I'm mentioning this to you for three reasons. One is that, yes, we should look back, all of us look back on the sacraments we've received, baptism, First Communion, Confirmation, Matrimony, and so forth. And it's not too late, even if you were married 52 years ago, it's not too late to say, Lord, how do you wish to strengthen the power, the dynamism of that sacrament in our marriage, in our married life, through some of these things? Let me give you just a few examples. I really do believe that the anniversary of a wedding is very important, and not just the 25th or the 40th anniversary and so forth. But I think on an annual basis, it's very valuable for a married couple to have a renewal of their vows and to bring together some of these elements. Yes, to fast before that great annual celebration of their marriage. Yes, to ask others to come and, and, and come, whether it's the celebration, we're going to have a nice breakfast or dinner or something like that, and especially if you can bring any of the living witnesses. I realize many of them might have gone before us or into other places. But it's very valuable for married couples each year to bring somebody who was there at the wedding over for supper or for breakfast on the anniversary to bring out photographs, to bring out memories. Because I think that that's one of the most important things we should be doing with married couples is renewing, renewing those vows in such a way. And as I say with writing down, Oh, how beautiful it is, and I'm sure many of you do this, to write a little letter to your dear beloved on the anniversary of your wedding day. But do do that. And I would say, don't be afraid to write something to your children. To say, it was 38 years ago that your mother and I were married, and let me tell you about that. Let me tell you about why this was the great day for our lives, and what it means for us, and how much we hope the blessings of God come to you. So in all of those renewals of sacraments, I ask us to do that with our baptisms, especially our children and grandchildren. You've heard me say, you're tired of hearing me saying it. If you don't know your own baptism date, you go get it. You go find it. Uh, again, that's the beauty of the Catholic Church. No matter how old you be, your baptism is written somewhere. 
It's one of the great excommunicable, not excommunicable, you get kicked out of the priesthood. If you haven't been keeping accurate baptism records at your parish, did you know that? It's one of the bad ones. The big bad ones, all right? You know, revealing the secrets of the confessional, that's very bad, okay? Well, it's not quite up there, but one of the big bad sins is for a priest not to keep accurate baptism records, not to keep them in a good, you know, sealed case, not to have a copy of the records at a safe deposit box in case the church goes down, and all the rest. As you know, if a fire burns down a church, the two things you do, you first go and rescue the Blessed Sacrament, and second, you rescue the baptism records, all right? Forget about the money, forget about the brownies in the kitchen. You go get the Blessed Sacrament and you get the baptism records. My point here, of course, is make sure your children know where their baptism date is. Make sure you send them a card. I mean, no surprise that our grandchildren think nothing of baptism. We don't even celebrate it. We celebrate stupid Halloween and we don't celebrate the baptism, the birth into new life in Christ of our grandchildren. So, Again, Martha Prosca here answers those questions on the phone five times a day. She just digs out the records and can answer anybody's question about when they were baptized. So please make sure that those are built into your family celebrations. So we're talking here about how we renew and bring revival to sacraments we've already celebrated. The second thing, of course, has to do with sacraments coming up. If any of you have grandchildren being baptized, grandchildren being confirmed, people getting married and so forth, it's very important for you to put real thought into how do we help serve them, not just by adding one other stupid gift you know, to the bridal shower, but how do we bring them into a vision of faith of the importance of this? And I would say, there's nothing quite like writing them a note. And it might seem to get lost in the shuffle as they're getting ready for everything. I'm telling you, if you write them a handwritten note and say, my dear granddaughter, as you get confirmed, I want to tell you something from my heart and tell them from your heart and tell them that the greatest thing you ever could pray for is that you'll be with them forever in heaven and confirmation is strength for that strength to fight the good fight and so forth please please do your part to help the sacraments come alive for your loved ones and much of it involves fasting it's really good for us to fast for the people that are getting baptized the people that are receiving their first holy communion for the people who are entering the sacraments Fasting, writing those testimonies, and especially, again, making sure you've given a witness to them of just how important all of this is. So, how do we help renew our own lives in the sacraments? How do we help others prepare for the sacraments? And then, as I say, how do we help each other in that kind of more general or particular form of consecration that we should do? This is the last thing I want to talk about today. Sometimes, sometimes there's a question, well, if I'm doing the sacraments right, do I really need anything else? I mean, along comes some movement, you know, going back all the way, I suppose, to Ignatius and the spiritual exercises and so forth. You know, we're basically with the spiritual exercises for bad Catholics that didn't really have everything the way they should. So now we got to clean them up, get them all set up and so forth. You know, what about 33 days of morning glory? Is that for somebody who's been kind of, ah, now we're going to get them in the army now and so forth. What about the Life of the Spirit seminars, you know? I thought I was baptized. Is that chopped liver? And now I'm going to really get the Holy Spirit like 2.0 or something like that? You can go through almost any spiritual movement and see that's a question that arises. What does this have to do with what I have in Christ in the life of the sacraments? And oh, this is fascinating territory, all right? Let's say just three things about this to start. The first is this. No authentic Catholic spiritual movement or ministry or group will ever be denigrating the power, the intrinsic ex opere operato power of the sacraments. It is the case that sometimes this person or that person at that retreat or that meeting, whatever, will say something silly and foolish, you know? You know, you know I, I, I know you've, you've had this or this, but come over here and you're really going to get it, okay? Careful, careful, okay? You know, I know the Holy Spirit's pretty good, but our group is really hot stuff, okay? <laughs> I don't want to meet the Holy Spirit on judgment and say, say, you know, we were really hot stuff. I hope you know that. <laughs> he will not be impressed with that, all right? So we want to make sure that we don't try to set whatever particular movements, consecrations, and so forth against what we've already received in the sacraments. Even for those who make vows to religious life, we're very careful, very careful to say this is related in a profound set of ways to the sacraments. Not only baptism, but of course religious life often involves a form of consecration that's like married life. 
So let's be very careful that we're never sort of saying, oh, you know, you can either have brand X sacramental life with the hoi polloi Catholics around, or you can part of the elite. Da, 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 you know, this is really the way. Now, related to that is a second issue, and that is, I've mentioned this before, we have to be very careful to recognize that the church, the church recognizes the great variety of spirituality and spiritual dimensions that are available to Catholics. What happens is this, you know, I always use the example, you know, I'm old enough to remember Ernest Angley, tuned in late night television and this a very strange preacher with a very bad toupee uh, from Akron, Ohio be on, you know? My name is Ernest Angley, and God has given me miracles and healing. And, and what it boiled down to is, is whenever you tune in Ernest Angley, about 30 minutes of very boring preaching and then the action, which is no matter who they were, what they had, he had two things, which is he would put his finger in their ear and say, come out, you know, for the devil or whatever, uh, and then he would push them over and amazingly they were slain in the spirit uh, <laughs> with holders to catch them and so forth. Well, you know as well as I do, I'm sure somehow early in his ministry, he did that, something good happened, and then he just said, ch -ch -ch -ch, lock it in. Now, no matter what your problem is, demon nicotine or whatever, we're going to put your finger in your cup, out, demon, you know, nicotine, uh, and so forth. Well, we can make fun of dear old Ernest Angley. I think he was a pretty remarkable guy. Uh, very bad uh, two-page, did I say that right? But, <laughs> but it's true for all of us. Each of us can have beautiful <laughs> spiritual experiences of one sort or another. And we go and we say, this is wonderful, this has been a great blessing, and now everybody else needs to do this, okay? Uh, an example might be some of the classic spiritualities. It's one thing personally to be called to be, again, devoted to the Franciscan spirituality, of course, as a Franciscan priest or nun or brother, but also to say, I think everybody should just be into Franciscan stuff. And I want to make sure the whole parish is this way, the whole parish is, well, careful. Careful, okay? The nature of a spirituality is you have to distinguish between what is normative. I mean, there really is a way that every Catholic should be Franciscan in some ways. Who was Francis? He loved God. He was, gave himself radically to Jesus Christ. Check, check, check. I'll say, but of course, there are a number of ways to express it. I've mentioned some of you before. I was a part of uh, charismatic covenant communities for a while. Very, very intensive communities, first in Baltimore, then in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and so forth. And, uh, you know, very, very strong covenant communities. Perhaps some of you have been a part of those as well. Well, the issue that came up over and over again with those communities and the related charismatic gifts was, uh, as, as a visiting priest from Nigeria came, a little guy, he says, he says, the problem with you is you have not figured out yet whether you are special or normal. Think about that, all right? Is what you're doing here, because what we would often say, kind of casually, this is normal Christian life. This is the way everybody should be living. Well, that sounds good, but careful, careful. Careful, careful. Does that mean everybody should speak in tongues? Because you speak in tongues? Is that a... Careful. And it can happen to any group. Any group, because what they're doing is good and valid and real and so forth. You know, everybody is supposed to make this consecration. They're saying you said so. Blah, blah, blah. Careful, careful. Because it's often the case that there are things that are elements of our spiritualities and spiritual movements that, yes, are normative. And yes, everyone should have this kind of relationship with God, with the Blessed Mother, and so forth. But the particular expressions of it, many times, are particular expressions. And we start to go over the line when we start to say, everybody. You get this from social justice people. All right, should we believe as Catholics and social justice? Of course we should. That means we should vote for Democratic House Bill number 399 on affordable housing and oppose those vicious, selfish Republicans and blah, blah, blah. Careful, careful. Okay, and that happens over and over again. Now, what does it mean? It means, first of all, that as we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, we must understand the age-old difference between making what are sometimes called private vows, private promises, and making public vows. All right, this is something that can happen. Sometimes, for example, people in a moment of, of great uh, prayerful intensity say, Lord, if you'll please save my grandchild from death, I promise to do thus and so. Sometimes, especially in certain cultures, you'll see it done in remarkable ways. You'll see people walking on their knees to an apparition site miles away. And these dear old people are on their knees in Mexico or somewhere like this. Okay, fine. We want to understand that the church recognizes the difference between, again, what they sometimes call private vows or promises and public. What's one of the key differences? 
A public promise is witnessed by someone with authority. Again, let's use the classic case. There might be people who make a certain private vow or promise related to chastity, to virginity, and so forth. But the church says, there's a, you know, someone says, I'm going to be a bachelor to the rapture or something like this, okay? Uh, but it's not until it's been received formally that there are certain elements to it. For example, some people come to me, I'll be honest with you, in the confession, they've made certain private promises or vows, and they're not really sure whether they should continue it, whether they're morally required to carry through them. That's something, again, to do, to talk to a priest in a confessional about. It's a bit tricky. And, and, and by the way, I don't simply say, ah, it doesn't make a difference. You did it back on your own, privately, in some sort of retreat. You promised this, you vowed that, and so forth. No, those can be very serious in the eyes of God. But it's important for you to talk to a priest in the confessional about those. Because many times, not many times, but sometimes, it's important for a priest to say, well... You should not let go of that promise or that consecration or that vow lightly, but based on what you've said, uh, I do not believe that you should hold yourself bound to it and so forth. And you need to have someone say that to you with real sacramental authority. What happens for other people sometimes is this, is they make some sort of consecration and uh, maybe they're initially there's a honeymoon period or something like that, but then you know, a year later they ask themselves, what was that about? You know, I was baptized in the Spirit. You know, I did the total consecration through Louis de Montfort. Um, a certain time later, what do I need to do? Do I have a brush up, have a tune up, and so forth? That's a very important question as well. And again, there's, there's, there's no simple response. Obviously, we all know that there's a kind of way that we fall apart spiritually. You know, we leak, as someone once said. You know, we might have been filled with the Spirit at a certain point, but we leak, you know. Well, that's fine. Talk to a priest in the confession and say, what should I do about the fact? Now, some of it's pretty obvious. We need to do the basic vitamins and minerals. We need to make sure that we don't look back on that particular moment. It's like, that's normal. You know, and I should be just jumping, jumping through rose bushes ever since and all. Well, sometimes, you know, most of life is not very dramatic. Don't be jumping to a conclusion that something wrong with the fact that I'm not just skipping back from communion in the aisle every time I receive Holy Communion. But talk to a priest about that. It's always been understood, it's always been by every legitimate spiritual movement, that we need certain ongoing times of spiritual renewal. And as I've said in the, uh, in the pulpit uh, many times, the Carmelites had a very good basic rule of thumb. That part of being the third order Carmelite traditionally was, uh, again, you know, an hour a day, uh, you know, again, uh, a day a week, excuse me, a day a month, and a week a year. And by golly, I think they're onto something. I have watched a lot of people, myself included, and their spiritual ups and downs, and there really is something to that. And I always want to highlight the middle one, that a day a month. It might not be a full day. It might just be taking a Sunday afternoon and slipping away where you can get three hours of quiet. But so many Catholics that I know, myself included, about once a month need something more than just their personal rhythm of daily prayer. They need that. That's crucial. But whether it's alone or being a part of a wonderful group that meets once a month, but it must have a personal component. You can't just be going and hearing a lecture uh, and having, having coffee cake and so forth. It has to have a personal silent dimension about once a month. This is crucial for many of us of keeping the fire alive, keeping the graces moving forward. Uh, again, some of us are starving because we decide we only need to eat a meal once every three weeks and so forth. There is a rhythm of spiritual nourishment. And so I want to strongly encourage you, including busy people here, people who, quote, don't have time. It's very important about once a month to get away for something more extended that is focused on spiritual. It's not just prayer. It might be uh, sitting by a nice a fire and, and, and journaling and talking about what happened over the past month, the goals I'm going to set for this month. Yes, it can have a quality of meeting with a circle of people on a monthly basis. But if you do that, make sure that before or after it, you're then also getting some personal time to, again, digest what's going on. I believe that the Lord doesn't need to give us, you know, unending fireworks. We live in a weird world that just says that, okay, that spiritual life is just nothing but drama, okay? <laughs> I hate drama, okay, as a priest, you know. Uh, some of us are really into drama, uh, and we feel like we're not doing something right if we're not having... Uh, basically a whole set of neuroses. And anyway, another issue. All right. You don't have to be dramatic to be growing in Jesus Christ. Most of it is very slow, very steady, very uneventful. But you have to do these things to keep that alive. 
Now, as we finish today, what I want to explain is this. I briefly mentioned this. That this series, of course, has not just been meant to be a, a set of sort of intellectual dainties. Oh, isn't that interesting or fun and so forth. It's been meant to help each of us personally <coughs> to take a look at our lives, including our sacramental lives, and to do a kind of a, a reflection on what does the Lord want to do? Perhaps for some of us, he wants, again, to bring alive the sacraments already in there. Perhaps for some of us, he wants us to come to a place of real consecration, a place of dedication. And again, I thank God we're in a beautiful parish where there are many opportunities to do that, whether with the Couples for Christ work or some of the beautiful work with the Marian movements, the 33 days, uh, Father Gately, and so forth. There are many ways happening all around us. But I think for many of us, especially in November, especially this time where we get ready for the new church year, which starts as you know, with the first Sunday of Advent. It's good for all of us to see this as a time of some sort of renewal of consecration of our lives. We come to this time of thinking about death and judgment, of heaven and hell. We're coming into this great holy season. What does the Lord want to do with you to help you to do that? Now, again, for many of us, it might happen with the groups or movements we're already a part of. For some of us, it's just a very personal experience. But I do think, based on what I said a few moments ago, that it can be very, very significant to have a circle of people join together and pray with you. Now, this is what I'm very excited about, is our wonderful group here of Couples for Christ, but some others here as well. Uh, this, this is part of what their ministry in life is over and over again. They join together and pray with people for the release of the Holy Spirit, for more power to come to them, to receive all that God gives us in the sacraments. And I'm very grateful that what they've agreed to is this, is that following next Saturday's conclusion. We're not going to have those prayer times at the meeting next week. But they will be available at the end of next week's meeting. We're going to talk about a few other things next week. They'll be available at the end of next week to schedule a time. They'll be able to let you know when might be some times if you would like to have people praying with you for a greater release of spiritual power and life in the sacraments. I also know I can speak on behalf of the groups who are present here. Some of the groups that read Father Gately's beautiful works and others here that they're more than happy to let you know the schedule of upcoming opportunities for spiritual growth and renewal. And they'll announce those and publicize those next week. Again, I have been concerned over the years, I've been a part of groups in which right at the end, uh, all of a sudden, you know, oh, surprise, surprise, we're all gonna sit in circles now and, and speak in tongues and say, hey, wait a second, false advertising. So we're not gonna do that kind of thing. No one should be under any pressure in any way for any of that. Uh, I've got some stories. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, I do think that all of this is not just meant to be sort of head knowledge and, oh, isn't that interesting. Somehow, we've timed it with the beginning of the new church year and the great seasons, and each of us personally should consider how we can take this the next step. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. I'm also going to talk about a few things about uh, how to help others, especially our young people, enter into the sacraments. And again, this is a big concern of mine. Uh, the devil will be happy if he saw you wonderful people, it wouldn't be happy if you all went to heaven, but he'd be okay if at least all your grandkids or grandchildren burn in hell. So uh, how do we help bring the power of the sacraments to our children and grandchildren? That'll be one of the topics, one of the topics we're going to conclude with next week. So once again, thanks for joining us this week, and we'll take a few moments for questions. God bless you. Any questions or comments, please? Including from some experts. We've got some people who really know what they're talking about. All this. <laughs> yes, please. Scott. Uh, so you're going to have a, uh, I think when, when you, on the onset of this series, you, when I talked about maybe having a mass, where they'll be doing pray over, is that still part of the plan or is it? No, the, uh, the plan is next week, which is the first sun, uh, Saturday of the month, is therefore have the anointing of the sick. My homily is going to tie in the sacrament, the anointing of the sick, with a more general uh, set of issues about how we offer ourselves to God and are consecrated to God. Thanks for asking that. And that's in the morning mass? That's in the 8 o'clock mass. That's right. Thank you. Well, very good. Once again, thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. Thanks to the hospitality folks. And uh, let's get ready for more. Always expecting God has more for us. God bless you.